Hello there. Wow. So I hope you like our new introduction. We love it. <laughs> big thanks to Kim for uh, fixing that. So a very well, very big welcome um, on this very warm, sunny day in the UK anyway, to the viewers and the listeners of the Women Leading Show. I'm your host today, along with my two other hosts. My name is Joe Baldwin Trot. I'm the editor, publisher and writer of the Women Leading Book. And I also have my co-host, Kim Adele Platts. Hi, Kim. Hey, Joe. Lovely to see you all. You too. You too. And hello, Joe Sumner, my other host. Hi, Joe. Hi, guys. Lovely to be here. Oh, it's fantastic. We've had a break um, and it's been kind of nice in a way. But actually, I've really missed our, I don't know, what, whatever it is we do uh, every other Friday at 12 o'clock. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, um, it's a lovely chat. It's a really engaging conversation we're diverse we try and try and dig deeper under those issues that cause women um, problems or cause leadership problems and actually for men and women because we've had male authors in our book we also have male guests but today you're in for a treat well I hopefully it's a treat because actually you've just got the three of us you have myself Kim and Joe, because we are all authors in this amazing book Oh, I need to get my camera back. Uh, the amazing book called, there we go. <laughs> I've had a busy week. I've been moving house. But anyway, the Women Leading Book, it's available on Amazon, on Kindle or paperback, as you can see. And also, very exciting news. Everyone is now recording their Audible chapters, which is really exciting because in, this is my um, second book I've published now. And one thing I've really realized and noticed is that when you get the authors to read their own chapters, we were going to have a proper audible version of this book, but actually when the authors read their own chapters, it connects on a, such a deeper level and you get the compassion. I mean, I have read this book obviously to death because I've literally read it backwards and forwards, upside down, gazillion times, but the audible versions of the, their chapters are coming in from the authors now and I have been in tears, I have been just totally engrossed and engaged and um, learnt, learnt and listened to the, the messages in this book from a whole different angle. So I am really excited about that. I hope you will be too. It will be free. Um, it, so another bonus of us doing this way, but we are going to be uh, putting out on a podcast through the Women Leading Show podcast. So if you're listening to that, this is where you'll find the book. But the Women Leading Show podcast is where this will be. So um, you can listen to the chapters and I can promise you they will blow you away. You'll really enjoy them. So enough about the book. This is our first chapter in series two, season two. Um, I've been watching too much Netflix, obviously. <laughs> I've been, been trying to uh, chill out at night because I've been moving house this week. I've just moved to East Sussex to the beautiful place called Hove. So I have this big seaside smile on my face. Um, but anyway, I'd like to come over to Kim and Joe and ask them what's been happening for them and the, what issues have been rising up. Because I must admit, I have had my head in the sand, not quite mm -hmm. literally, but figuratively, both speaking. Um, but what issues have been raising up since we last met for you and uh, that you've noticed? Joe, do you want to go first? I don't want to leap over you. <laughs> No. So polite, you two. Come well, on, we polite, American guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's been well, as you know, I'm I'm also in the beginning of moving as well. So personally, I've had my head very much in that. Um, but work-wise, one of the things that's noticeable for me is the attempt to resume some kind of normal. So. I'm a coach and a yoga teacher and meditation teacher. And a lot of my coaching work is done in ongoing uh, personal development groups. And um, where I find my leadership is at the moment is helping people really thrive in the uncertainty and um, really encouraging people to deal head on with the fear um, about not knowing what's coming up, not knowing if we have another lockdown to face what it will mean for them and helping them develop their resilience, their ability to de just deal with not knowing. Because we, uh, I think, leap into wanting to control. And I'm certainly noticing that in myself that, you know, I'm having to be very careful around moving house because 
I, I can see the desire to control every aspect of that that I possibly can because I can't control various things that impact my business. So I'm just sort of been musing on that, how, how much we like to have control, what it means to give up control um, and be able to go more with the flow and how that means we're actually more agile, which is something we all need to be in business and um, how leaders have to go first. You know, it's my job in those coaching groups to be the one who goes first, to be the one who wrestles with the uncertainty and finds that peaceful place. Um, so that's what's been coming up for me. Yeah, how about you, Kim? That's, that's great. How about you, Kim? Yeah. Yeah, so so all of that so resonates, Joe. I think um, certainly from talking to a lot of my clients, the um, need to be able to become an agile leader uh, to lead in the new augmented world that we have of more remote and non-remote uh, working and that need to be flexible and to recognize that actually you're going through the change yourself as well as leading people through the change. So having some, I guess, some time to, to be kind to yourself um, because that can be quite a challenge, can't it, to be going through that change and leading that change. But you're so right, they, the need for leaders to, to go first and to put ourselves in that sometimes uncomfortable position to show people the way. And I think one of the other things that's been coming up, um, certainly for a lot of the clients that I'm doing work with, is the ability to be able to engage, enthuse and empower their people in the new world mm -hmm. and to keep them connected. Because I think people started to feel a little disconnected with all of the enforced changes. And you're right, control is control something I think we've all been lacking, but so is choice. Um, so I think for me, you know, when we went into lockdown, there was we all mourned something. And, and for me, the thing I think I mourned was lack of choices because you weren't able to make some of the choices that you had historically been able to. And I think that's driven perhaps that desire for control. Yeah, definitely. I, I, that's really I think that's what it, life's all about, isn't it? At the moment, we, you know, we're waiting to hear a notification that we're allowed out or we're not allowed out or. Um, and actually, most of us that are, have our own businesses, we're a little bit of a kind of controlling nature, aren't we? Is that fair to say? I think <laughs> because you have to be, don't you, to some extent, because you have to really juggle the balls and keep everything monitored and keep it going. So right now, you know, I, I must admit, I personally have really struggled with being told what to do. I'm not very good at it at the best of times. Um, so I think it's it's a really key key issue. And especially for leaders that are have big corporates, you know, I'm hearing so many different stories from uh, leaders, men and women across the board with their different size organizations, that they're having to just completely readjust how they lead and their styles. And obviously we're all on Zoom. And this has got this is a whole topic. I think this is a really fascinating area that we could have a, a, a segment on because I really believe that at last, and I have worked in, in industries and businesses with a, a phenomenally stiff structure and sharp structure, but actually because we're all just <laughs> however big, two, two square uh, inches, sometimes even centimetres if you're on your phone trying to run a meeting, um, then actually it's a level playing field. There's no top of the table. Um, and I think it's a really exciting time. And I know, Kim, this is your bag really, isn't it? Because a lot of your clients are on are top level leaders um, that have big big uh, boards, etc. How are they finding it? Are they finding it quite a challenge to adjust? Um, yeah, it's been it's been a, it's been a fascinating journey because to start off with, I think everybody thought they were doing great at it. You know, like oh, it's okay, we've just gone up to Zoom and it's and it's all okay. Um, and then they realised that actually they were feeling a bit disconnected, but so were their people. So. Um, because there is an element of, you know, when you go, when you're doing something like Zoom, you are now in somebody's home. Um, and that can feel a little bit uncomfortable because you're like, well, I'm not sure if they would have invited me into their home. I mean, I'm their boss, I'm their leader, but they might not have gone, yeah, pop round, have a coffee. Um, so people, because they're a little uncomfortable, stick solely to the task. So they started having conversations that was purely about the task at hand. And they stop asking the, I call it the, um, the water cooler effect, you know, those conversations that you have about, oh, you look nice, or um, what were you watching last night? What, what, what is your Netflix um, recommendation? And they might sound trivial, but they are a key part to connecting with people from a social element. And I think 
but as you know, because I think I've bored you all to death with this before, but I think it was such a shame we used the term social distancing and not physical distancing and socially connected because that's what we need to be is physically distanced, but socially connected. And I think we need to reinvigorate that. So a lot of the leaders that I've been working with, is, it's been around actually how do you now recreate that social and engaged element with your people? Because we know before we went into this, one of the biggest um, debates around board tables the world over is how do you attract and retain top talent um, and that's become an even bigger topic right now which is how do you attract and retain top talent in the new world because you can't always see some of those um, body language giveaways um, so you've got to get really good at listening and listening to the words because people unfortunately will leak whatever's going on in their life through the words that they use and most of the time we don't listen and therefore we miss them so you'll hear somebody going oh yeah you know I'm fine well for me you know fine means fed up insecure neurotic and emotional so if I'm ever fine get me a glass of wine and run away <laughs> it means I'm anything but fine because there's always a better word so, but it's it is a universal one that allows you to not have to say what's really going wrong and it allows the other person to not have to ask because you've said you're fine, so I don't have to do any more. I can just take it at face value and I can get out of there quickly. But the reality is we all know when we say it, we don't mean it. Um, mm -hmm. so then saying, you know, don't call them out on that, but have a have a follow-up conversation to just check in on them, to just say, oh, you know, I'd love to just grab a coffee and just see how things are going. You know, what's it feeling like for you? How, we, you, know, how are you getting on? Is there, is there anything I can do to help? Um, because it's often a cry for help or you go on a you go on a zoom and somebody doesn't turn on their video and I've seen leaders getting really frustrated about that <laughs> it's like it's a call for help if they're not going on video it's because they're not feeling connected so rather than get angry and go and yell at them you probably want to be empathetic and go and understand what it is that they're feeling and how you can help with that but you know so we've really got to get much better as leaders at realizing it's not about us it's about them so instead of us focusing on what is it we need, we've got to focus on what is it they need to be able to thrive. Because when we deliver what they need to thrive, then they will deliver what we need for our business to thrive. Um, and we'll all collectively grow together. And I think for me, that's the, I guess that's the key takeaway. And that's been quite a shift <laughs> for, for some of those leaders. And it can be quite hard because a lot of leaders think that they're already doing that. It's like, well, I'm all about my people. It's like, mm -hmm. Yes, maybe, but we might need to work out how that comes across. That's really interesting, Kim. I think hopefully because I know you've got your own podcast show um, and YouTube sh YouTube channel. I hope I hope you're doing a one show just on that because you know uh, leading on Zoom because you've hit some really powerful points there that people wouldn't. You know, and I do quite a lot of big group calls um, in my 50th partner group, group. And I just assume that perhaps they just fancy being in their pajamas or, you know, that maybe the, the, the kids are around and, you know, they're on either on mute or um, they've got their screen off or both and just listening. But it's a really good point. And, and God, you hit so many different points there that you should, you know, you could really put into um, probably a book of your own. But thanks for mentioning the word fine, because obviously that brings on me on very nicely to something I've been really busy with. And if you don't mind, and I'm, I know you guys won't. Um, I will mention the book that I'm creating now because the next women leading will be um, will be is also in the pipeline. So it's women leading enterprises and founders. So women that have created um, businesses that are really trying to change our planet, our society, and grow communities. Um, but at the moment as well, I'm also creating a book called Being Fine, um, and uh, it was almost like I'd I'd paid you for the show, Kim. Because you've just kindly highlighted the reasons and the purpose behind the book, which is we are in a time of difficulties and challenges and, you know, a lack of what we feel like is control. Um, and this word, I call it the other F word because it gets used when it shouldn't. It should be a word that we don't use. We stop ourselves from saying and we actually explain how we really feel. It's focused on men. So if anyone is watching this, listening, who would like to, has a story to share either about their partner or their, you know, husband or brother or, or obviously themselves about their experience and what happened when they realised they do need to share 
and they do need to open up. I've already got 12, 14 authors um, and uh, from all over the world. It's very exciting, but please uh, do join, do let me know on um, the women, women leading uh, global at gmail.com or proper books publishing at gmail.com. So anyway, uh, so yeah, so it is a time when we really need to share. And, and like you say, Kim, I think um, I hope that more more uh, leaders are creating those water cooler moments. A friend of mine is um, a manager for, for John Lewis and Waitrose, and uh, she has had incredible challenges. Uh, she she heads up the tech team, um, so they're obviously used to working on tech. And that's not an issue, but she has really found a lot of them are completely closed off. Um, and they're not, you know, tech people can t tend to be quite uh, introverted anyway, sometimes, generally, not generally, but, you know, so actually she's really had to work on creating those one-to-one -one coffee sessions. So again, you hit another nerve. So, um, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's true. And actually, you know, a lot, a lot of teams, a lot of people were already working remotely. Um, and therefore we kind of went into lockdown and go, well, I already work remotely. But the difference I think is we took away choice. So I work remotely, but I can choose not to. I can choose to go into the office if I'm feeling like I just want to I just want to catch up. And and actually, I, I think for a lot of leaders, this is where we've got to make more effort to create virtual water cooler moments for the team. So not just what we do one to one with them, but how do we make sure that they get connected, particularly those teams where perhaps people are a bit more introverted because they are introverted. But that doesn't mean to say they don't want to connect with people. They just want to connect in a you know, in, in a different way. And we did a, the other week, which was quite fun, we did a um, virtual pizza party. So we delivered pizzas to all the people in the team. So they all arrived at the same time. And then we went online and just did a, you know, just ate them all together and had a, uh, had a couple of beers and just a catch up. But people loved it um, because it was kind of, it just gave you some chance to just chat, I guess, and, and just have, um, you know, we, we broke out into, smaller groups and then all came back together but just like you would do if you were at a party wouldn't you you'd go and like chat to a couple of people and then you'd come back and chat to some others so I think the um the need for creativity is probably um a much needed skill and Joe obviously with all this stuff you do with like yoga and, and retreats and that I'm, I'm guessing do you see that a lot with your clients what we're finding now I think is um so under very controlled conditions, I am actually back teaching in person. And it's been really interesting to see who's come back in person and, and um, who's actually stuck with online. I have a few people who stuck with online. I live stream, so that's possible. And um, it reminds me that there's a whole generation of people that really need our care um, who aren't in the workforce at the moment. So actually, a whole bunch of my retirees, I, I teach different segments, um, have come back because we're in person because it's part of their social network. And one of them was telling me this week that um, for her, it's part. it really is part of her mental health because her husband is so terrified of of catching the virus that he will only do food shopping that's the only reason to leave the house so she's been going solo on walks and things like that and um not been able to meet friends you know she's in an older group and actually coming out and being social together is is just a key part of her mental health so i think that yes in our workforce we need to be very mindful of those connections with people I'm, I'm aware of, particularly of the uh, members of my groups who live alone, for example. Um, but also, uh, well, in fact, that reminds me that one of them is a key worker and she says that um, she, she works in a school and she's been providing support for key workers children this whole way through, that um, if they're getting sent home to self-isolate, if there are cases, that she'll have two weeks at home, potentially followed by another two weeks, potentially followed by another two weeks and that that would be an enormous struggle. So this um, this need to find ways of being social is, is really real. Um, and I feel a sense, I had one question really when you were talking earlier about the burden in a way it is how I heard it of leadership. When it comes to that ability to look after people's emotional and mental health, because that's my field that's that is what I am paid to do 
Um, whereas leaders have their job of leadership and then now this growing requirement um, to be the coach, to be the counsellor, to be the support, to spot in all their different teams um, the people who aren't showing up in the same way that they would normally. And I, it just sort of caused a moment of, you know, what is it that they need for their own care, but what is it that they need for their skill set to help them do that? Because one of the reasons that we answer I'm fine is because we're not confident that the person wants the real answer. That honestly is the truth. Mm -hmm. So we need to actually address the skill gap, I think, and, and help leaders with that part of the burden of leadership, which is there needs to be somewhere for them to go when it gets overwhelming. And it, I just feel... people to manage that yeah yeah it's, it's so true because i think i feel like my internet may have just dropped out did it come back it's come it back now it did, it did drop yeah. just at the critical point i feel <laughs> like literally hanging on your every word and then you went silent for a second um but but you but you're right you know there is a new burden of leadership isn't there and um, you know, I always joke that everybody needs a critical best friend, you know, that person that tells them their bum looks big in something before they leave the house, not when they've strutted around thinking they look amazing. And I guess that's kind of almost what, what uh, we're doing as coaches with our clients is, is being that safe space, because actually, as the leader, you're going through this yourself. So you've got this new burden, you need to be there and showing up for people, but you also need to acknowledge that you're needing that too. Um, and that doesn't mean that you're not doing a great job, that you're not an amazing leader. It's just that you're a human being as well. And actually finding that space, because for a lot of for a lot of leaders, where do you go? You know, I can't tell the board because they might lose confidence in me. I can't tell my reports because they're expecting me to lead. I probably can't tell anybody at home because they'll get worried that I don't think I can um, do it. So so where do I go? And I, I remember an old boss of mine many years ago, um, great guy who said to me, Kim, you need to realise that it's lonely at the top. And I was like, I think that's really sad. Um, as, a, as a member of your team, I don't want to think you're lonely. So, you know, I want to know what my question would be, what can I do to make you feel less lonely? Uh, and whilst I might not be able to take on all of your work, because if I did, then you wouldn't be my leader, I could take on a percentage of it. So, you know, you've got eight direct reports. If we all took on a bit of it, would that make you feel more supported? Um, and he was like, nobody's ever asked me that. So maybe that's the problem. Maybe we just need to change the question that we're asking um, to enable us to think of things from a different viewpoint to, to find a way through. Yeah, definitely. I, th I think that's that's really true. I think it, you know it, it's a it's important to recognise how challenging it is, but also find a solution. Um, to um and, and something that th this came up with the book actually this week um but it's about being able to be vulnerable as well and and you know it's it's something we're really notoriously bad uh, bad at doing um and i think this is a whole this this whole situation is creating a, a great opportunity for us to all show ourselves as a bit more vulnerable and that can only then because everything is energy so if a leader starts saying, well, actually, I'm having a really tough time at home managing my kids and the working hours or whatever it is. Um, so this, you know, and actually we've seen it in the top leadership in governance where certain leaders, um, obviously, Jacinda Ardern, a classic example, who has just shown that vulnerability and, and said, look, this is happening for me. Um, and that really compels us, doesn't it? And I think that's that's really important. Um, and actually, Joe, Joe, I'd like to come back to your chapter in the book, which is very much about how how you lead from within. Um, and I, I really, once I read your chapter, I was so glad, you know. And obviously, if I'd thought about it, it would have been the angle you you would have gone down with your work as a coach. Um, but it, I have done so much work on working out who I am and giving myself permission to be truly who I am, to be able to do what I do. And that, that sounds quite simple, and I just said it in one sentence, but in actual fact, that's taken 25 years of therapy, Reiki, um, classes, meditation, fitness, health, sharing, having a great tribe around me. But can I bring you back to your chapter in the book? Because 
you you hit on some amazing points. I know we've had some amazing feedback about what you wrote about in the book. And just summarise what what your purpose of the chapter was. Well, I guess my goal with the chapter was to find that place of honesty. Um, you know, my background is as an academic, and I could have written you a very academic piece. And that would have missed the whole point, basically, as far as I'm concerned, it would have missed the point. Because leadership is the, in my view, leadership is the inner journey, it's the hero's journey, it's the journey that you take to meet your potential. And so for me, um, with the chapter, what I wanted to do was, was to tell my own story uh, with finding how to be myself when I came from this very academic background and had an academic career originally and lived in a world where you were judged by your ability to rack up points in the research assessment exercise, which literally just rates how many points you've attracted for your university, which will translate into funding, right? It's a, I mean, wow. What a way to get your value is just literally, rack it's like racking up Tesco points in a way, you know, and that's how your value is given to you. It, it, it's soul destroying. Um, and our academics do it because on the back of that, they get, you know, they get the money to do their research and answer their questions that they're fascinated about, but it's kind of a necessary evil. And it felt like the world that I was in was a collection of necessary evils that I had to somehow navigate my little ship through and still find the way to be Joe in the middle of that. And it was so ironic for me that I worked in ethics. So uh, that's my background. I spent 10 years working in ethics. And ultimately, it felt like such an unethical way to be a human being. Because by the end, I would say to people, it's like I'm a brain in a jar on a desk. That's the bit of me that has value. And it's not even people who talk about, you know, being alive from the neck up. It, it, it was just literally the brain, just just it, the brain in a jar on the desk, and then uh, and the rest of me will go away. And that and that would be fine and there won't be any difference. Coffee. And um it's it's crazy. It, it it's crazy and it made me ill because the rest of my body then was essentially <laughs> what about me? Um, and I really got quite ill and I experienced burnout by 30, which I think is quite young um, to have that. And, and I really then, I feel launched on the proper uh, hero's journey or heroine's journey, which was, so then who am I? What am I here for? What's my purpose in this universe? And like you, I've had decades of that personal work, which has been a therapeutic journey, a coaching journey. I've gone on numerous, numerous retreats. I've asked myself the difficult questions about who I am, but also about what this world is and what my relationship to it is. And what is it that I want to be a stand for? And then from there, from the inside, you've got some hope of doing that on the outside. You know, when, when we're saying being fine, it's a mask, right? Mm -hmm. It's something that you interject between you and the person asking you, you and all the world around, because you're saying I'm not okay, but I'm not feeling safe enough to say what's really happening. Well, the safety comes from inside. And I think that's one of the things that um, I feel really passionate about because it's it's such a huge thing to achieve for yourself is I feel safe in myself and from there I can venture to be vulnerable from there I can venture the bigger risk which gives us the bigger reward potential from there I can say I'm asking you to make these difficult choices because the only way we get through this is together but when that's not there they f they feel they come across as empty, and it it's it's unnerving. Um, I don't know if you've ever been on the receiving end of this, but let's say you're in a social context, and you have somebody who's so raw that they're disclosing without any boundary, without any edge, and it's actually 
quite discomforting. Like one doesn't quite know how to step in and, and hold that. That's an example of when somebody's not found the safety within themselves. And that's when you really, really do need to provide a container and help them, if they can, get to a professional who can provide that container. Because if it's a social context, it's not your job. Um, but I feel that that's what I did for myself. And that's what the book uh, chapter is about, is how does one become one's own container, right? How how does one know what what we individually are here to do we each have a thing we're here to do and for me it is to teach it is to teach and I learned that through the process of investigating of being a student of trying and then seeing what did it feel like to stand at the front of a room and it It felt like the light turned on it's so true it's so easy isn't it to just follow a path and if things happen quite straightforward or through your training when you feel like you have to um, continue down a road that you've decided on um, and obviously this is very much like very much personal to my own journey um, which has been very zigzaggy um, or, or straight as a die whichever way you look at it but um, it, it's it's important isn't it to actually recognize that there is a purpose for us it's called the, your dharma, and it's the reason why you're here. Joe, I dig deeper, and I know I know you, you get this, but you, you're you here to teach people to how to be truly connected emotionally, spiritually, and physically, and I, I see that in your work. Um, but it's, it's recognizing that actually we can do something that really connects it all, connects our own dots, and also values our skill sets. Because now I look at you, what you do, uh, compared to what you used to do, I think, oh my gosh, you must have literally led, left 75% of Joe at home when you went to work. But I would say the same when I was, you know, in a lot of my jobs, that I would only bring part of myself to work. Um, and I think probably, Kim, you're nodding, and I, th I think this is definitely part of your leadership coaching as well. But um, so many people do that, and it happens. It happens to us before we even realise. And then... If you and if if you're feeling you're leaving most of yourself behind before you go to work, and you actually walk into that the the door or, or go on now online to work and you leave part of you behind upstairs in the kitchen, there's something fundamentally wrong with what you're doing or how you're doing it, and something that is disconnecting you from what you're doing. Um, but it does take work, Joe, doesn't it? And I know Kim, you've done you've had your trials and tribulations, but it does require work and it requires digging quite deep and sometimes in um, a very kind of unexpected ways of, of healing. And sadly, sometimes that means very strong, deep theta healing, emotional, spiritual healing, whatever that means for you. But I really, just to finish off, and I'd like to ask your input, Kim, but I really believe, especially as women and women leading and women taking st centre stage, just because of the numbers. If you just keep it really simple, there aren't so many of us. So when I see a female MP stand up in commons like Wendy Chamberlain, who's kind of a friend of mine, she's amazing. She has done so much work and confidence creating and building to get in that position, not literally physically, <laughs> but also emotionally to, to hold her own in the House of Commons, deliver a speech to, you know, Sometimes it almost looks like they've got earmuffs on. They're not even listening, like you were saying right at the beginning of this show. <clears throat> that takes quite a lot of strategy and consideration, but it does come from the inside, doesn't it? So, um, so I know Kim. Obviously, you've had a very interesting journey to get where you are, and you've done a, a fair bit of stuff too. Yeah, Carol. I think, and, and you know, I love both of your chapters and, and learned so much. And I think. For me, you know, life is just one big lesson. It's one big journey of learning and 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 discovery. And you know, you know I, I love a quote. Um, and for me, the one the one that kind of sums it up it was Pablo Picasso, who says that the meaning of life is to find your gift, and the purpose of life is to give it away. And I think that's been for me the the summary. You know, I'm still learning my gift, but as I go, um, whatever I have learned, it's sharing that. It's it's giving that back to people to help them. On, on their journey but you know I remember for years being 
having having an image of what I thought I needed to be to be a corporate leader. And you know, as, as you guys know, most of my time I've spent life like a hyperactive puppy dog. <laughs> so I didn't really fit the corporate leader. And kind of I looked around going, oh, I just don't, I just don't measure up to, to that. And then I remember probably getting my first um board level role and realizing that life was a little bit too hard to try and be somebody I'm not and to try and do my job it's like I can't do both of those that's like two full-time jobs trying to pretend that I'm not hyperactive <laughs> and also pretend that I can can deliver this role so I remember going into it and going if if I'm going to make this work they're going to have to it's going to have to make it work as me and I'm going to have to turn up as I am and hope that that hope that that's okay and I remember going to the interview and um uh fabulous lady Adrienne asked me uh, if you had to sum yourself up in one word what would it be it was the end of the interview and I was like loud and I'm sorry I said well you've been with me 50 minutes do you think I'm loud and she was like well yes that's in that case it's self-aware and it's honest I'll stick with it and that was kind of my first moment in being able to go just be you like you don't have to have a personality bypass to be a leader it doesn't mean to say that you can't do the big jobs you can't make the difficult decisions you know I'm I'm passionate about the fact that to lead, we have to lead with kindness, humanity and courage. We have to take those difficult choices. We have to navigate the difficult situations. We've got to lead people um, safely and kindly to the other side. But but you can do all of those. They're not mutually exclusive. Um, but I think it, it does. You have to you have to dig deep. You have to go through some real soul searching to get comfortable. And you know, both of you have mentioned about vulnerability and I think we've been brought up to think that vulnerability is something to be ashamed of or something to hide from and yet the truth is all of us are vulnerable about something we all have that one thing that we hope nobody ever finds out about and you know I spent 20 odd years hoping nobody would ever find out I was a hairdresser you know <laughs> they'd turn around and go oh my god we put the hairdresser on the board quick get her off you know this is this is not going to work for us um and now, now I realize that actually it's not my vulnerability it's my superpower because as a hairdresser, I learned to listen to people, to be really interested in them, to try and understand what was important to them and why it was important so that I could create what it was that they wanted me to create. And I guess at its simplest point, that's leadership um, because that's what people want. They want to be listened to. They want to be understood and they want to feel valued. Um, and as leaders, that's where we've got to get. And by sharing our vulnerability we create a safe space for them to share their vulnerability and when they share their vulnerability we can help them with that and together we evolve don't we we're, we're stronger yeah it also um <clears throat> it reminds me that what makes us like people is actually their vulnerabilities I don't like my friends because they're all amazing so they are amazing that's not what I like about them what I like about them is all our little funny foibles you know and the things that make me laugh and the things that uh, make me care for them are much more those unique characteristics and that's what made that's what that struck for me is is if our leaders could understand that the things that they might see as something that uh, if you like downrates their value isn't that it's just what makes them human and therefore approachable and accessible and somebody that one of their staff would be more likely to come to and say look I'm I am struggling um this is difficult I need to share that with you is there anything you can do to help is there anything the company can do to help it's much easier to do that with somebody you don't see as shiny and complete um so yeah that just that made me smile um the other thing, though, Kim, that I wanted to pick up on because it was so interesting is how long it was that you held on to the identity of having been the hairdresser, because actually you spent far longer working your way up through the bank and then through uh, the financial and te technological company. So you actually spent far longer as a corporate uh, employee than you did as the hairdresser and yet that was the identity that you held on to and and used as that oh you know is, is this a weakness I mean I'm so glad you found it's your superpower now but isn't that out of balance it's so fascinating oh, how we do that crazy crazy it is again yeah, well, totally out of balance I mean but I think I think a lot of it was um 
I never got another qualification. Um, so for, for a lot of years, I always got put forward for future leader programs or, you know, got spotted as, as talent. And then they would make you fill in these application forms, even though you'd been invited. And, and then they'd look at them and they'd flick through them like this and they'd be like, uh, Kim, where's your degree? And I was like, well, I don't have one. Where are your A-levels? Well, I don't have those either. <laughs> I've, got a, I've got an MVQ in hairdressing. I'm really proud of it. <laughs> I like worked really past it. So I think there was moments kind of throughout the, throughout the journey, and that kind of went on for a good 15 years, where it kept reminding you that actually almost you're an imposter um, because you don't have these things. And to have these jobs, you're supposed to have been better educated. You're supposed to have been to university um and i think well well you know i i suffered with my imposter syndrome until i had my little girl so my little girl was my breakthrough <laughs> so I, i'm forever grateful for her but i had this awful moment once i uh, suddenly hit me um that the voice we talk to ourselves becomes the voice we teach our children to talk to themselves and in that moment I felt like the world stopped. I mean, I think it was probably just my heart because, you know, most people think that I'm kind and, and considerate. But trust me, I can be absolutely evil when it comes to the way I've talked to myself for 40 odd years. And I, the thought that she would ever, ever talk to herself the way I had stopped my heart. And I was like, in that moment, I realised I needed to do the work. I needed to go and fix myself because you can't just say to your children, don't do as I do you've got to do differently because they they watch not only what you say but what you do and that's what they learn and it was like I so she she really has been my absolute savior because to ensure that she doesn't do it to herself I had to go and understand why it was I was doing it to myself what was the part of my past that needed healing that would allow me to actually value myself I mean it's an awful thing to say but you know I spent a lot of years I I didn't you talk about self-love. I didn't love myself. I didn't even like myself very much. It's like I was evil to my to myself. Um and I can say that now because I've done the work and actually I do now like myself and I do take care of myself now and I can acknowledge the things that I've done. But for, for a lot of years I couldn't. And I meet so many people that are in that position and knowing what knowing what that feels like, knowing how hard that is to almost live a double life on the out you know, outwardly you're trying to look like nothing um goes wrong for you that you know you you can do all of these things I had somebody say to me um they listened to the journey that I did of my hairdresser to, to CEO and and they said you know I'm a thousand times more likely to hire you as a coach now because looking at your profile on LinkedIn, it looks like nothing's ever gone wrong for you. Um, and then you hear your story and go, actually, quite a lot's gone wrong for you. So um, you have at least been able to deal with things that have gone wrong and still come out and found a way to be positive and keep going. And um, and for the first time in my life, I can actually say I'm quite proud of that. You know, so you have to say, you know, I'm quite mm -hmm. like what I've become because I went, I had one hell of a time getting here. And I think once we can get to that, place um we can help other people get to their place can't we and that's when we really do get to shine our light on the world i guess yeah definitely that's it. i mean <laughs> human spirit sorry we're talking over each other <laughs> so i just think i mean i think what comes across now and as you were talking there is is um just the brightness of the of the human spirit in you you know you're radiant and it is that knowledge, that self-knowledge and um, self-love that comes out that you can see when it literally shines out of somebody's face that they've achieved that and that will attract people to you. And it is the big, big job that we all have and what a broken system we also have that qualifications should matter so very much when there you were being spotted as talent again and again and again. And then I said, well, hold on a minute. This isn't like the standard way of getting here. Um, and surely it's time to move away from that. No, I can yeah. completely agree. More so for, you know, for for the next generations. And, you know, I have got a little one and Joe, I know, you know, you've got um, the girls and it's, it's what can we do, isn't it, to make it easier for the new generations to to not 
you know, I'd, I'd like to hope they don't get to 44 <laughs> before they realise that they need to do some work, which sadly I did. But, um, you know, what can what can we do different as differently as a society to help it be more inclusive for all people, you know, relevant of their qualifications, their class, their gender, their race. But how do, how do we stop putting people in boxes? Yeah, and I, I think it comes back to um, actually your CV um, and what our own perceptions, obviously, Kim, because in your mind, obviously, you needed a degree, um, but you didn't. But that was your perception. Um, but also, I think it it comes to how we we are we assess each other um, and the systems that we use. And there's actually a new song, and I just had a quick look to try and find the title of it. So I listened to it the other day. But I can't find it, but it's. It's a song about um, I'm not what I am on paper and it's written by someone and it's someone really big and so I'm going to kick myself after this. Um, but they've written a song about actually it is very irrelevant what we have on paper um, and it really matters who we are and also how we've learned from what, what's happened to us as well, where we are now. And I think, you know, in Britain especially and especially so many of the large corporations but it is changing they it's it's very uh, competitive and it all comes down to what well, well, who's got the degree and who's got the best degree and it still works like that whereas it really shouldn't because you know I, i'm you know joe and i have both been to university and i've been with people that have literally done the bare minimum got through a degree and they've been surprised themselves at the end of it they got it so how is that person better than the person that's worked their socks off? They've, they've scrupulously done every deadline for every assessment. They've worked, they've researched. Um, they've tried to do everything they can to get that degree. So where is that in the, and it, it doesn't feature, does it? Because you, you get a first, a two one, a two two, a third or a fail. So it, it, it is all irrelevant for sure. Um, and also, as we all know, I'm, I'm pretty sure, racking through this in my head quickly, we've all had uh, managers, top level managers in, in very good businesses that actually have been F deep awful. So yes, they've been managers. Yes, they've achieved that status. Yes, that's on their CV. However, if you unpeeled the layers of what they've been as a manager, well, um, you know, and directly looking after people, they have treated them badly. They have encouraged bullying or discouraged or, or not done anything about bullying. They they may have had terrible communication skills. Does that come out in the role of, uh, say, for example, head of sales? No, it doesn't. So it, it does all come from that. And I, I think that that's that fundamentally it's a huge flaw in our system. And I do know American companies are much better at the interview having more weight in the value of what happens in that interview, how that person comes across. Um, and I'm really glad to hear, Kim, that you're getting, you're getting, you know, work actually when you disclose that you have this incredible, because I've always said to you, um, hairdressers, oh my gosh, you hear every story under the sun. You sit there and listen to me. Well, you don't do my hair because we live a bit too far away. <laughs> um, but uh, but you sit there and you listen to people go on and on and on because you know if you're looking in a mirror it's quite hard not to get a bit self-reflective I think in that in that situation um, but you know I take my hat off to you because and I, I think you also need to publish a little book by the way called Kimisms because you have all these little Kimisms that crack me up and that you, I, I must write them down because every show we do there's at least three Kimisms <laughs> Do you know, it's, it's funny you say that because I've got a friend who I actually we became friends. We worked together twenty odd years ago, and she and she sometimes messages me now and goes, "Oh my god, I got three Kimisms in before lunch." <laughs> I was like, well, "I can't believe that it's become it's become a thing." Um, because that's for me, they seem they seem really really normal. But for other people, other people they were like, "That's hilarious." I'm like, "Oh, sorry." <laughs> Which you can no, imagine, why it was really hard for me to ever bottle that and try and be really corporate. And it's like actually. Once you once you realise that you don't need to, and I used to jokingly say, and, and I know Joe, this does go back to the, how long did I hold on to my um, hairdresser piece? But people will literally tell me anything. You know, they say nobody talks to you on the tube. People talk to me. <laughs> but nobody talks to you on the train. People literally tell me everything, and I used to think it was hairdresser based because sometimes it'd be like. I need to stop. <laughs> that's, that's back so much. You can stop 
that now. Um, but I think it was possibly just the fact that you you look open to it, you look interested, yeah. and therefore you know, pe people engage with that, don't they? And, and Joe, you said earlier, you know, it attracts people to you if you're you know if you're interested. But it's, it's people the energy will you tell emanate. their hairdresser literally anything. You know that <laughs> things that you find out, they just like. <laughs> well, and I don't know how I'm going to look at your husband or wife when they come in on Saturday <laughs> in a new, brand new light. Um, but I guess it's, it is that, I think, you know, I think as society, and I, you know, um, my niece, bless her, uh, is just starting university. And it's, uh, you kind of think of them going to that, you know, to that next part of their journey and the amount of anxiety that they're was in what if I pick the wrong subject or what if I do the wrong thing, not just for her, but for her friends. Um, and, you know, my brother said to her, so, uh, just do your best and enjoy life. You know, look at look at Auntie Kim. She didn't do any of that. And it's not done her any harm. And that wasn't to try and belittle her for what she was doing, but to say, actually, don't make it so anxious. You know, this is this is not the be all and end all. It doesn't mean education is not important. It is. You know, I think life is a journey in learning and we learn something you know my nan always used to say every day is a school day and it's true you learn something new every day if you're open to it but I think we have to think as you've both said about the structure in which we're doing that because it seems like we've created a society where the learning only counts if we do it in a certain way if we mm -hmm. it doesn't matter yeah. if we choose to do it in university or if we choose to do it by just doing the roles by just rolling our sleeves up and getting on and doing the practical learning or by reading books, listening to podcasts, having conversations with people. All of those are great ways to learn if we're open to it. And I think we need to, I guess, create a, a different way where all of those are equally represented. And I thought it was fascinating, Joe, when you were saying um, it was just the choice of words. It interested me that you said we've all had managers who have not been very good. And it's true. We have all had managers who've not been very good. We wouldn't call them leaders. Um, whereas actually, when I think about it, I have had managers who have been brilliant, but I wouldn't call them managers. I'd call them leaders. And I think that probably for me is that kind of definition, which is manager is what you get by the title. Leader is what you get by who you are and how you show up. Mm -hmm. um, and how do we pull that out of somebody's CV to say, that just tells me you managed. What I want to know is how did you lead? And that comes from the heart and the head. Um, whereas managing is head only, isn't it? That's such a great, great way of looking at it. And actually, I think um, it would be worth, we have got some watchers uh, right now that are live, but uh, I wonder how many people have had, um, how, many, how, what, how many, sorry, which leaders can we remember having that we really that were re really there for us and helped us through a journey and how many managers. And I would say the amount of leaders I could put on one hand. And obviously I have worked in a fair amount of corporations and businesses and private public sector, but yeah, that's great. Which leads us on to the topic for our next show as we are just about coming to the end of the show, which is uh, actually role models. And uh, you obviously Kim are a lovely role model for your niece that actually we don't necessarily have to do ex, you know, certain things in certain orders um, and we can achieve what we want when we desire it. But um, role models actually are very important and I really believe a key factor to how we achieve equality. And with that, our, get more and more gradually, slowly but surely, there are more role models in governance and in government in this country um, and it's gradually changing, but way too slowly. So we are going to have one of our other authors from our wonderful book, Janelle Mansfield, who is here. She is going to come to us from Canada. Uh, well, not literally to us, but come online. She's an author in our book, and uh, she's written a brilliant chapter about how she lost her backpack. And I'm going to leave it like that because it's a metaphorical backpack, not a real one. Um, but the subject is role models. So please tune in. Uh, have a look at this book, have a look online. I haven't quite got that yet. It's been one of those days, a bit busy. Um, so have a look online at the book and uh, tune into our next show on the 9th of October. This will one will be at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, British summertime, because Janelle is obviously in Canada. We don't really want to make her up, we get her up at 3 in the morning. That's a bit unfair. So um, we will get her, we'll tune into that one and uh, look forward to talking about that really important show. But lovely big 
Uh, thank you, as always, to Joe Sumner in Ealing, West London. Used to be my neighbour, but not anymore. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> Great to see you. Nice. Uh, Kim Adele Platts up, up and Grantham. I'm rubbish at accents. That's the last time I'm going to do that one. <laughs> Great to see you. Thanks for joining in. Thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed watching or listening to this show. And we'll look forward to uh, seeing you or, or you tuning in next time. Have a great day. Thanks, all.